So, Carson, you get the floor. Okay, welcome everybody. I, I want to talk about a project from the University of Bremen. I just have to make it a little bit more. <laughs> so, uh, that's us. It's only me today for the presentation, but uh, on the paper also Fatima and Isanne worked with me together, and there's some other people in the project. It's a part of an impact project. It's a larger cooperation between different universities, and it's funded by the Ministry of uh, Research and Education. <laughs> and so you already told us what the e-portfolio is, so I think they don't need to uh, focus on this. I just have to get this uh, picture of all of you away, but I don't see my... Oh, you cannot, as far as I know. No, no, I, the problem is I, I see uh, all the people here, but I don't see my mouse. You cannot. You cannot. This is Zoom. Yeah. You, you can change it to be up or down. Yeah. That's the only thing you can Fantastic. do. Fantastic. So, um, and this is the Apple limitation, you know. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> we'll see how good I know my, uh, my slides. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> If we, and this is what we want to do in at, uh, higher education, we want to uh, support deep learning. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that portfolios can be uh, act, uh, effective in motivating students to actively engage with the ac academic content. And so it's, especially if you incorporate some generative learning strategies and the e-portfolio is, the, the example, the example for uh, generative learning strategies, uh, but uh, to do it right, uh, you need to give formative assessments and feedback. So you should always look at the process and and give feedback and all that, and especially uh, highly informative feedback uh, that gives some uh, feedback about how the students are. Proof, uh, uh, going on with their tasks, uh, how they're doing, and, and if the self-regulation strategies are good and all that. This, this is all needed, and uh, but there are also limitations, and the worst thing which can happen is that you have late shallow or missing feedback, and if that's the case, uh, this really reduces the motivation of the students. And uh, the problem, the major limitation uh, to successfully provide this timely, highly informative feedback is the time resources of the teachers. We all know it's a lot of work to give feedback, especially timely. And, and so I think a lot of the potential of portfolios are missed because either people don't do it at all because they think, oh my God, I have to do so much feedback work or they do the portfolio and it's good, but it could be better because they don't give enough feedback. So this is me. <laughs> um, so why are we doing it? Um, we, uh, <clears throat> especially with the, the portfolio with its multimodal nature, people can write, have uh, like sch schemas, they can do uh, uh, like, like mind maps and concept maps and all that. Um, it would be good to support this, uh, but uh, mostly the feedback in higher education is more or less summative, and it doesn't take into account all the multimodal compositions, for example, like creating uh, explanatory videos, and it's just too much uh, time effort to, to do this. So the... Um, the Big idea is that we are using AI for this, and uh, at the University of Bremen, we are using the Mahara ePortfolio system. Uh, it's, it's called Peer uh, Portfolio Individuell Elektronisch Reflektiert, and it has also a Nordic touch, so you always need to plan your acronyms wisely. And so these are two examples of portfolios of students of mine. We are doing here. The task was to create some kind of media biography and then to compare this to empirical data and to see how is my media biography different than the media biography of my students and then to reflect on this, for example. And this is a more elaborate uh, uh, portfolio here. Uh, the task was to, in media didactics, to 
of, uh, to think about teaching with explanatory videos in the classroom and then to select some of them and and, and to well, first get into the, on the topic when to select some videos which would, would could be used in a certain uh, lesson and then they should really create a concept how to use this uh, explanation video in there in a in a the lesson setting and create a kind of arbeitsblatt for for to use and to use this and then reflect on the practice in the in the classroom so the general idea is to use multimodal a large language model to assess e-portfolios and give formative on demand feedback to students like I'm doing my feedback by my portfolio, and when the student clicks on the feedback button, how am I doing? When this goes through some model, and when I get some feedback, and hopefully, uh, it's not guaranteed, but hopefully they do some further improvement. So the general idea is very good, but it does not work in a way, or it does not work in the way we all would like to, because if you just use uh, some some easy prompt engineering, uh, but there are a lot of papers who show that GPT-4 is more about uh, assessing the generic uh, essay qualities, but it's not very good into digging into the deep content nuances of uh, the acad uh, academic teaching. So, um, so, and there's some papers uh, like this, this is another one, uh, there's a moderate positive correlation between ChatGPT grading and human uh, correction, but it's not, very strong. I mean, last week I was in Essen and uh, uh, there was uh, Lea Reinhold, I think she, she presented the study where she showed that at least in assessing very good essays, there was a strong correlation between human graders and ChatGPT, but in the not so good ones, the, uh, the LLM tended to uh, overinflated the grades. It wasn't so uh, so critical. Okay, so so what what are the goals of our modular architecture? Um, we want to provide better explainability to give students a chance to know why there's there's some kind of feedback um, to better control the alignment of the of the system so we really do what we want to uh, control bias. Um, to identify hallucinations so that, like I said, the, often the systems, they, if you ask them to identify uh, things which are missing, sometimes they come up with stuff which is not in the student's uh, portfolio, but it just tells you it's, it's there because it's somehow it appears. And also to allow the use of a combination of different scoring models. So I will elaborate on this more in the architecture. So we have this architecture and I will uh, just uh, go into this a little bit more detail. So the thing is you have this e-portfolio and people are creating their e-portfolios and they uh, as essentially e-portfolio is a kind of multimodal composition of different uh, media like texts, images, videos, etc. And if you want to give it to an AI model, you need to extract this data. And um, the thing is that you could do this like a leap to A, for example, you get all, all the stuff you need for the individual analysis of these uh, types, but uh, then you just uh, lose the layout in a way. And so you well, what we are doing is that we are using different ways of extracting information like we use leap to a to have all these uh, these uh, texts and images for this individual analysis but also and this is an example from another paper where we used layout parser and layout parser is not a large language model but it's it's just uh, uh, the deep learning framework and this allows you to identify the layout of uh, of pages and tells you uh, 
what is what can you see? I mean, now with lava, for example, you can do this also with other models. That's a big problem in this field. Uh, your paper is always uh, a half year old and it seems dated. <laughs> so, uh, but what you can see here is uh, here the uh, the precision scores and. Like it's it's been really good in identifying things like like images and videos and all that that is sitting on the page, uh, but uh, I, I'm I'm sure it it could be uh, improved. And also, what it does not do, and we want to use lava for this uh, in the future. It's more like how is it arranged, and are there any structures? Is it like like Grobit? I don't know what crop it is. Okay. Um, and so, so how do we do this? So, so in the beginning, we have this like this didactical planning and setup of assessment. Like you have this idea what should people do in the that says box one. What should we do? What should we learn? Uh, what tasks should we do? Et cetera, et cetera. And then you start to create your rubrics, as we've seen in the first part of the session also. So we create all these rubrics uh, for the um, um, for, for assessing and and to look what what could be the right performance criteria and indicators uh, for this. So this is all human. This is all human. I mean, you could start to also use. <laughs> And to help you in rubric construction, but this is really the thing you need to do as a, a human. And the idea we have is not just to use just the one large language model and just to prompt it and then see what happens. But uh, the thing is that right now we do this per hand, and in the future we want to have some kind of shaky shaky's toolbox where people could do this and where there's maybe some some help in this but uh, to to look at your um, at your rubric and then ask yourself okay how could i score this like maybe there are some easy <laughs> criteria like it should be at least 500 words so you don't need a large language model and run it for 20 cents uh, to know if it's 500 words, but that's just a very easy way you can check for 500 word lengths and so on. So, so there are some rule or statistic based, based models, like also for readability or, or things like that. And then you have uh, these machine learn based models and this can be like the layout parser can be some kind of deep learning uh, uh, models, which are really available, or you can then go to the generative transformer models and they also have some kind of spectrum of things uh, you could do from zero shot prompt engineering, you just do your prompts up to um, uh, uh, multi-agent setups like AutoGPT, where you would set up uh, a lot of different uh, small uh, AI agents who start to uh, come about to assess the criteria. Okay, and the, the, uh, the thing is, when we put all this outcome into a table, in a metric scoring table, so we have, like, this is a rubric uh, uh, criteria, and then we have all these uh, the outcomes for the, each of the students. And, and then, again, we, we are using a large language model to come up with the feedback out of this. So, so basically we, we feed in with the, the model, what did the student write and what are the scores and what are the rubric uh, descriptions and then so on. When it comes up with, with some uh, feedback and this feedback then is uh, reviewed and corrected uh, by, 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 by human right now well and and it will be it well, there has to be at least in Bremen there has to be a, a human in the loop because this is critical this is dangerous uh, AI use so you cannot leave anybody out because then it could leave somebody getting out of university for example. Okay, and then my students give uh, get the feedback and hopefully they use it for um, for uh, improvement. And so this is a small example. I mean, it's we're not 
as far as we wanted right now. So we I show you some very not so much empirical data. Uh, so, but this is example uh, in uh, in this recent seminar what we were not using a, um, a portfolio but just explanatory videos the students had to create so the task was to create a tutorial or a presentation video about the topic they had to learn about and then they had to create this video so and what then we took on to see if we can really handle this uh, multimodal stuff is that you take the input video and um, when you on the one hand you do extract the audio because the audio is a text in a way so it's a really like a dual mode uh, paivio model <laughs> and uh, you also do a scene detection so the videos we had and we try to elaborate on this in the next uh, uh, version is the students nearly had only text bullet points and some some images but it wasn't really very multimodal so i didn't like the videos very much so this time i gave them for the new version we are doing right now we gave them much more explicit that you have to do schemas and you have to do it step by step and so on so we can go more on this. So what uh, what we're doing is doing scene detection. So every time the, the, the video changes, there's a new, uh, there's a new uh, image. And then you can give this Im image to uh, to Lava. This, this is a multimodal uh, trained version based on Lama. And it's quite good. You can ask it, what can you see? Describe what you can see, etc. So you can talk about the images. You can do quite a good prompting. And on the other side, we uh, on the audio thing, we, we took Whisper, which is an open uh, model for uh, audio transcription, which is really good, actually. And from this, we had the transcriptions of the text, and then we gave it to Lama. So we split up the things, uh, different modes. And uh, we... Also did, but can I show you, but I just say what we are doing here with the audio analysis with Prat. This means where you can, for example, where, this is a deep learning model where you can show how fluent is the speech and how, uh, how, how good is the pronunciation of it. So there are other things you can uh, measure of, uh, of the audio transcript. Uh, not uh, not the audio recording, not the transcript. And then you have all these features again, and then you uh, uh, give this with a prompt to give the, the feedback. And we did this in a real seminar setting. Uh, there were about 35 students, and they created in groups these eight videos. How, how am I on time? How much time do I have? Uh, you have um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, five minutes. Oh, yeah, that's, okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, so the topic was uh, information technology infrastructure library, which is uh, this is something in the well, these are best practices for IT service management. So these were the IT students, and we used in this the, the data I show here. We used an old model, the Leo Mistral seven B model, which is kind of German language model or based or uh, uh, tuned for German language. That's why it's called Leo, uh, and it's from Bavaria probably. Uh, so this wasn't the best model, I think, um, but at least something came out. Um, and so what the, the tutors did was that they marked the points of the feedback, they thought critical from the, the AI, but gave it to the students anyway. So the students could see what came out of the AI, but what did my tutors think wasn't right. Okay, so and they also got a, a real feedback from the uh, teachers. And we had a lot of prompts. So there were some content specific criteria, and then we had some design quality criteria of explanatory videos. Uh, we took from the different sources. And um, 
when we interviewed with students, the students we did this in a group interview setting, uh, they were in general, they think it was positive because they thought they got more feedback than they ever had in the whole study life in a way. Uh, but they also said that the large language model fees are long and sometimes redundant. So, um, and the feedbacks from human tutors are more precise than from AI. So, to, to keep this in context, the, like the, the AI uh, feedback was like this because it's bent over all of these uh, criteria we had. And the, actually, the tutor content was like this. And it just said, oh, you did this good and uh, watch out for this. And uh, I liked this one and maybe do this better. And that's it. And it's a great one. 1.3. So, so this was the normal thing they, they get. And actually, some of the students are quite happy with it as long as the grade is okay. And, and, and so, so that's, so it's, um, and then, and then not actually, uh, only one student group used the AI feedback later on to prove a video. So they felt motivated to do it better after they, uh, uh got this. Problem are uh, that uh, if the tutors, when the tutors looked at it, they, they did not always recognize contents correctly, and and in this way, it, 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 sometimes it also uh, criticized wrong arrows. Uh, but overall, the LLM captured the contents quite good of the videos which were created, and um, sometimes also it really get things mm, mixed up so so sometimes there were content problems uh in in the in the in the, in the criteria and sometimes also it's this is a german fine-tuned model but sometimes they had german and english mixed feedback and the students were quite uh irritated uh by this <laughs> the first workflow variation was that the to your first read the AI feedback, when we watch the videos, then write assessment and just have to do one or two of these videos. They said, no, no, we can we cannot do it like this. We are much too primed from the AI feedback and, and we cannot do our own thinking. So they switched it and, and this was better. But no time saving <laughs> because they had to do it anyway. So, um, so what will we do next? Uh, we, there's a lot of improvement in the prompt engineering as always. Uh, we want to use better models, um, and also uh, we want to run the AI assessments uh, multiple. We do want to do multiple runs because if you put it into it. Depends on the temperature of your model. It gives you other uh, uh, thing. And sometimes, sometimes, if you have a lot of students, it's a really bad answer. And if you do it like eight times or seven or eight times, there's something which emerges to come, and it's it's better. So and also to use more specialized agents for single rubrics. Um, last, uh, I think it's the last slide. Um, so what, what we are doing right now is that now we are looking at groups of larger student groups and also uh, want to do quantitative analysis of the assessment of the feedbacks by the students and the, and the tutors. Um, and yeah, well, I mean, um, we also are now starting to do uh, one and multi-shot prompting. So this means that we give them more an example of how we think uh, what could be uh, given as a student uh, answer and how to evaluate this. We didn't do this right now, and we want to see if this uh, can improve uh, the quality. And and also we are interested in using multi-agent implementation of, of this because in a way it's it's already something like this. And and uh, from the impact project, there's a researcher in Frankfurt and she's uh, investigating uh, student feedback, students' feedback literacy. And then she's saying that student, uh, feedback literacy is a very important thing. So students in a way appreciate and use feedback at all. So we want to assess this also or ask, uh, measure it 
in, in future studies to see uh, in Germany, sometimes we say Perlen for die Säue. Uh, so, so it's, it's the, the thing is, do we really can work with, the, or how should, how do we have to make a feedback that they can work with it? Because if you are, if we know that the feedback literacy we are low, we need to do the feedback differently than the, the feedback that is very high. Okay, so these are our uh, contact informations. Thank you very much. So we do like this. <laughs> Whether we can. Yeah, I mean. So Kerstin is, is in Germany. She knows German. This yes. is a, a new person uh, here. Um, uh, but first, let's let's go for direct questions to Carson, right. and then and then we can introduce her, and then we can go for the second presentation, and then she will do the third presentation. Um, question direct questions to Carson. If you don't have any, I have one small one. Sure. So do I understand properly that the rubric mostly introduces the prompt, so creates the prompt? But otherwise, you don't. You don't. Uh, the rubrics also maybe define your pipeline or something like this. I'm trying. Yes, to... yes. But, but, I mean, uh, it defines if I use an LLM at all, or maybe I use something different. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. And and then the future it would be nice to assist. Right now, it's very much you need to know all about this whole system. And in the future, it should be like, okay, I have this, uh, this rubric and with this criteria. And then now, please help me uh, choosing some kind of agent or some, some, some tool to measure this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Uh, a lot. <laughs> no, 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 no. Only small questions. Huh? The rest is in the discussion. We failed last time. You know, we actually lost Finlay to ask him about his AI. So we should not do the same error this just time. Just the discussion here. Uh, <laughs> uh, just was I get it right. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, you use the LLM for prompt yeah. generation, yeah. but you also mentioned it. I'm not quite sure whether you are uh, right now using it, in fact, also for the analysis of the portfolio, is it? We we don't use the LLM for the for the criteria definition. This was just an idea. You could do it, but right now the criteria, the rubric criteria are all done by humans. Okay. And uh, the, the the LLM is used for assessing the students' portfolio based on the criteria given in the in, in the in the rubric. Okay, yes, yeah. This creates some kind of uh, assessment, which goes into this uh, table of yeah. we have all these different criteria and the values, and later on the we take another LLM. That's the question: Is it a different LLM, differently trained, or is it the same one? Maybe? Right now, it's the same one. Yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, uh, the thing is, right now. I, probably it's better. I, I we don't have the time to to fine tune the system right now, and we don't have the data, and then so we are just like we think about well, in another year the next model comes around the corner, and even if we train something, it will be not good enough against the other model. So that's it's a standard model you're using right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but that's just, but this was uh, the last examples you've seen. Well, this was Leo, but internally we are now using uh, Llama 3.1. Huh. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you again.